Everybody say, first things first. First things first. The first things first. We begin to talk about how we ended last week, and we say we've been seeking and dwelling and wanting the presence of God. Listen, a wretched sinner like me needs to get before the Lord so I can dwell in the presence of a living God. But the first part, I am a wretched sinner. You are a wretched sinner. That's who we are. We're deserving of death, but we got a God to love us. Amen? Wow. I want to share this message with you this morning, but... Some of you said some stuff, and last week I was standing up on this altar in the spirit tunnel as it came through. And you know what? God does some incredible and amazing things, doesn't he? Yeah. But as the anointed leadership began to get up here, you had the first two that messed you up, right? Jessica and Karina. I didn't align that. God did. And then you go on down there, I said, I begin to watch some of these leaders just cry out to the Lord as they pray specifically for you. And watch John Miller down at the end begin to pray for the tunnel. And I seen you come up here and filter through. And I begin to see you extend and pray for the victory tunnel. And I begin to hear the praise and worship team come up and accomplish you with praise and worship and honor to our Lord. And we say, God, we just want your presence. We want your presence. We want to be better in 2020. God, help us to love you more. And as I stand up here, God began to show me some things. I caught, caught up on this altar, and I began to stand on it. And over top of the stump tunnel, I began to, to begin to rebuke some things. I seen a spirit of addiction trying to take somebody. I seen a period, a, a spirit of slothfulness trying to jump on somebody. I seen brokenness. I seen things as you was walking through here, and, and some of you said, "Man, once I got past Jennifer and Craig, when I got underneath there, I don't even know what happened. I could hardly even stand up, man. I felt the anointing or the presence or something of God as I began to walk through there, and there was something that was supernatural. What was happening is God was taking your own natural, and He began to decrease it, and He began to put His super on your natural, and He began to anoint you. And when you stepped up into the pulpit and you come up in here, when we talk and we praise and we pray." And we worship God from corner to corner. We begin to say, Welcome to the tabernacle. I begin to work the welcome into the place where he dwells. We begin to say, Come on up here and just give you a little piece of it. Woo, that was powerful, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow, wow. And then I begin to get off of this. And I didn't know what was really going on. I turned around and said, Excuse me. There's a lot of people up here. And then I began to walk down, and God began to show me conditions, and I seen my, my sister Becca standing down here, and God said, pain. And I remember touching her, and I, I said, God, let her know that we love her the most of all. God, did you love her? Yes. And, then, and then I began to see some of the leaders, I began to pray specifically for them, and I began to see them get wrecked as God was praying and touching and anointing. Do you want that? Yes. Do you want that? Yes. Do you want that? Yes. See, the thing is, God called us to walk in that anointing. God called us to walk into the presence. God called us to take it to the highways and the byways. Listen, you come in here today with something that's got you shipwrecked. It's been a generational curse from year after year. Uh, you've bought into it. You've hidden it. you shut it up in the closet. But God come to expose it today. Amen. First things first. Everybody say first things first. Today we're going to talk about fasting, but first things first. Now, what's fasting? Guess what? God didn't give me a fasting message today. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> but listen to this. The fasting starts today. June, uh, June, uh, I'm sorry, January the 15th goes to January the 12th. The fasting is anything that you want to fast that gets in your way of your time right. with God. Whatever that is, it's none of my business. It's your business. You hear me? Yeah. So for us, we said, well, you know what? It really gets in our way is going out to eat and always planning and trying to figure out how to do it and how to squeeze everything in. Let's just get rid of that. Right. Let's cook at home. Let's share family time. We started this week, actually. 
and start thinking about what we should be focused on, which is Christ. So whatever it is that you're supposed to fast. Now listen, and a lot of us are doing food. We're going to fruits and vegetables for a week. And that's awesome. But if you're already a fruit and vegetable person, you ain't doing no good anyway. Amen? Amen? So then he said, well, Pastor, I think I'm going to uh, go ahead and fast television. You ain't watching it anyway. All right? So you ain't fasting anything. My whole point is this. Whatever is in your way. It could be that television show. It could be that cell phone that you hold. It can be social media. It can be whatever it is. It can be food. It can be other things. The Daniel Fast talks about replacing all this crazy food that we eat and, it, and replacing it with fruits and vegetables. Whatever your fast is, it's personal between you and God. But I'm going to ask you to do two things. I'm going to ask you to fast. You hear me? Corporate fast. It's, pri it's not private, it's public. We're fasting. Right. As we fast this week, and whatever your fast is, I'm going to ask you to do the second point. Okay, the second point is I already asked you to do is pray. And I'm going to ask you to pray specifically. You guys ready for this? I want you to pray for the almighty presence of the living God inside of my church for the entire rest of the existence of my church. Yes. You hear me? Yes. Now this church started because it was broken and somebody laid on the floor right there and said, God, make this a place of worship again. And guess what? It's a place of worship again. So as you fast, whatever your fast looks like this week, there you go. Those are two things. Whatever, you, whatever gets in the way, whatever's in the way, whatever you can get rid of for seven days. And then also, secondly... Now listen, I'm going to tell you. Some of you already know what it is, right? Right? Women listen to me. Not just because men too, but women, some of your husbands already told me on social media. All right? Uh-oh. Call your trouble. Look at back there waving like crazy. Dad. Just take care of your wife. Now listen, seriously. Some of you, God's already spoken to you, and you're saying, I ain't laying that down. I've got to have that. I've got to have a reason. It's up to you. But I'm asking, whatever it is, God told you to get rid of it. Okay? Everybody say, I'm getting rid of it. Yeah. That's right. That's what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of it. First things first. So that's all I'm going to talk about. Take it, get it personal. Replace it with prayer. And make God first in everything you do. That is true regimented fasting where you'll do what God's called you to do. Everybody say, I'm doing it. Yeah. If you're not doing it, well, you're in trouble. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> now, I guess I should. I don't have time to speak on this. But remember, fasting attracts demons. All right. Uh, the, uh, and it's, it's not a mood point. It's a point that you got to remember. If you're not spiritually strong, be real careful and be real, really, truly, uh, 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 just uh, be apparent and obvious to what's around you. As the enemy use people, places, and things to come and try to attack you during your spiritual fast. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's talk about this. Now we're going to move first things first. As you see it on the board. Are you guys excited about this word today? Yes. I'm going to go really quick, and God's giving me some notes. And the end result is what I'm after today. I want to teach on what God's given me. When I get through that, I remember something about the oil. And the oil is just, it's just oil, okay? There's a representation of the presence of God. It's a representation. There's a representation that when we begin uh, to pray for people to be healed, we have an expectation that they'll be healed. Yeah. We, have, we have an expectation when people come in with demonic forces and they're trying to hide them. You can't hide them from God. No. We begin to talk about the things that's going on in our society today, the things that's always wrong, but we're trying to call them right. That's not who God is. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. So we want to preach truth in this pulpit again today. We do not never want to steer from it. Today, I want to be speaking this morning on first things. So I found in God's word where it says, do this first. Okay, do this first. I found it many times. I want to share that. And it, and it will align you for the blessings of God. And I'm telling you, we need some blessings of God today in our lives. Yeah. Seven times uh, it says do, the first, uh, do, the, do this first, do this first, do this first. It keeps telling you to do these things first. And if you put my word first, my blessings will overtake you in this new year is what the Lord has for us today. Are you ready to put him first? Yeah. Amen. I think we are. Yeah. Yeah. I hope we are. The beginning of the year is a good time. To get things straight. Amen? Amen? It's a good time to get things straight. But I think about alignment, okay? Everybody knows what that is with John Miller at. The mechanic John Miller. Back here hiding right there, okay? John, wave your hand because you can vouch for this. And if there's any other mechanics, you can also. When I begin to think about alignment, I can't help but think about my car or my truck. Uh, you could be traveling the smoothest road in the world, uh, heading off into the sunset. 
And all of a sudden, you know what happens? I have a story I shared before about knocking our cars or our vehicles out of alignment. We hit a curb or in Ohio, we hit a pothole, and all of a sudden your car is no longer in alignment. It always seems to happen as soon as you get it in alignment or when you get new tires. But you get up to about 60 miles an hour, 65 or 70. Of course, we don't go no faster than that on the interstate with Christians, right? And we got a fist on our car, so we ain't going over 70. And my wife's laughing. She says, hey, you go about 90 yesterday. And the last day to get saved on you, by the way, is your right foot, okay? <laughs> only joking, but I, sometimes it's true. All right, just going with the flow. Officer, I was just going with the flow. All right, he said, I was too. All right, so yesterday I'm driving. I'm just cruising. I'm thinking about a whole lot. And I'm running probably 80 some mile an hour. Really, I'm going with the flow. Guess who I follow? Stay out of control. Yeah. I said, oh, my goodness. I don't think you can get me from back here. She said, no, there's a car in between. So good, I'm going to go with the flow. So sometimes we go with the flow. Amen. But when I think about this, uh, this alignment thing, it, it, what it does is if we hit that pothole, and if you've ever had, anybody ever had one of the old, older cars, when you get knocked out of line, it's out of line, it's like, duh, 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 duh. yeah? Oh, I've seen you young people with some of the older cars. <laughs> you get to understand this. You know what it's like when you're holding on over in your arms, you've got a flab on them, away, because you can't hold on to the well. So what you do is you get one, so it just makes you look cool, right? And if you had the old cars, what you did, your journey just got a lot longer because you're fighting it to keep it on the road. And you like to go 70, but you got to go 40 because anytime you get up over 40, that alignment, that journey has been altered, has been changed. Things begin to happen because we're going in a direction that we had not planned on. Uh, we begin to say, we'll go 70, we're going slower. Things begin to change when we're out of alignment. I thought about this when I was having knee problems several years ago. And at the time, I went to... I uh, went to my chiropractor, uh, he's a Christian brother of mine, and, and my knee was injured, but my whole body was out of the line, it was hurting. Uh, the aches, the pains, they, they began to get everywhere. There was something that was uh, needed to happen that I needed to get uh, the alignment of my body right, is what my chiropractor said. I said, what is this guy talking about? I can't because my back hurts. He said, your knee just hurts. And I said, what's that got to do with you? I line my back, it hurts. He said, well, the problem is, and you're making your, I want to make your journey a little bit easier. And he gave me the, the, for instance, you know, your car's out of alignment. Oh, yeah. Your knee's out of alignment. Your back's out of alignment. Your hips are hurt. I said, come on, brother. Now you preach it. But the truth was, my knee hurt, so everything else began to hurt. Because uh, you ever experienced that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All those old people say, hey, hey, amen. Yeah. Now, as you've seen the commercial where the guy said, hey, ah, uh, ah. Uh. There's an advertisement. He said, I hurt my neck. She said, you hurt your neck. Yeah, I was trying to button my pants. I hurt my neck. She said, you hurt your neck. Button your pants. Can I get an amen up in the head? Yeah. That's the over 50 crowd. That's what happens, I heard. But you know the truth is, that's what happens. All of a sudden, that's not what we're intending to do. We're going in a direction, and all of a sudden, we get to cramp in the neck, button our pants. We begin to understand that the car is supposed to be, the journey is supposed to be, everything is supposed to go a certain direction, and that's what we have intended as Christians. Say amen. amen. We know that's the truth. We need to take an inventory. We need to take some tune-ups over the next year. We need to tune in, to be honest with you, and get in the Word of God and make sure we're heading in the right direction. It's time to get aligned. Everybody say it's time for alignment. There are two distinctive different definitions for alignment. Two distinct definitions for alignment this morning I'm going to share with you. Both have significant spiritual implications. The first of all is this. When we look at the first one, it says arrangement in a straight line or in a correct position. All right, so alignment, arrangement in a straight line or a, in, in, into a correct position. Is that right, mechanics? Yeah. That's right. Okay, so we want to get all the tires going in the right direction. Because the tires are full, all four ends working against each other, what's it do? It wears them out. Yeah. It separates the belt. Yeah. It wears out, it separates, it destroys. Uh-oh. Woo! Mechanics are going to get this today. Amen. Arrangement is in a straight line. We've been to look at what the alignment is in that straight line. And secondly, alignment refers to a position of agreement or alliance. Whew, this is good. So now we understand that what we got to do and what I'm going to talk about is this alignment this morning. I'm going to give you time to take a picture, write this down, because this will make complete sense as we go through some things that God showed me and make the first things first. But arrangement in a straight line or in incorrect position, a position of agreement. A position of agreement, okay? Did you come in here to agree with God's word today? Yeah. That's why we come to church, right? Uh, we talked about how we are and what we need. That's why we come to church. If you want to be in the correct position to receive 
the favor and the blessing is from the Lord, you have to align your priorities. You have to align your priorities with God's word. Do you hear me? You have to align your priorities with God's word. Whew. Amen. Let's close the prayer. But when I was thinking about this, these seven things that God showed me that we must put him first. Seven different things I want to share with you quickly this morning. You have to align your priorities with God's word. The first one is you need to get your, get your priorities and get them straight. Get your priorities and get them straight. So today, if you're sitting here and you went through the end of a year and you said, Lord, why again? And we make New Year's resolutions and we begin to say, well, you know what? I've had that one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, and it goes on. Uh, one year, uh, one decade, two decade, three decade resolution that we've never conquered. The question is this. Can we really put God first this year? Can we really, as a church body, as a group of believers, put God first this year? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, very familiar. Seek first, everybody say first. first. Seek first the kingdom of God, and it says, and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. First things, alignment of priorities. First things, alignment of priorities. In order, in other words, you must dethrone what stands between you and Jesus. Same purpose as the, as, as the past, right? We've got to dethrone what stands between you and Jesus. What is it? Some of it is pain. Some of it is addiction. Some of it is unforgiveness. Some of it is hatred. Some of it is abuse. Some of it you was abused. And the list will go on. But the first thing, <clears throat> we need these priorities aligned. We need to dethrone whatever stands in, in between us and Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit Say it with me. Spirit, spirit soul, soul, and body. body. Spirit, soul, and body be preserved, blameless, <clears throat> be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What you look at, when you, I'm going I'm to jump on this a minute, but there's an order here. What happens is, it's like that alignment, things get out of order. Things get like they didn't mean to be. And things begin to happen. Notice this order. Spirit, soul, and body. So often, our order is flesh, and flesh equals body. Okay, that's what happens. Flesh is first, then our soul, our, our attitudes, our happiness, and things as such, then our spirit. So all of a sudden, uh, it's easy for me to, to come to a place where sometimes I want to say, look, I've already told you that's enough, but where's the spirit component? Sometimes we'll say, look, I'm going to give you what you deserve. Oh, where's the spirit component? I'm not very good at the spirit component sometimes. Are you? That's the question for you and I today, and it's an overarching question that we must not forget because it says it has spirit, soul, and body. When the body is leading the spirit and soul, things are completely out of God's order. But notice God's priority. I said spirit first. Yeah. We're talking about first things first this week. It's important we don't forget that. Seek first the kingdom of God, and I will preserve your spirit, soul, and body. But it has to have, to have, it has to have the orders, the spirit first, and everything else will be blessed. Spiritual alignment must be first. And today we come in to get a tune-up or a tune-in or to know that it's time for us to begin to get things right in our lives with Christ. The Christian life is not me first. If you know anyone that lives a life that's me first and I don't care who I destroy or who I hurt or who I walk on or what I spew, the truth is they're living a life of self and not selflessness. It is the kingdom first Hear me, if you will say the kingdom first, that is the alignment of God's blessing, and he will bless you. But first, you've got to say, God, what is your will? God, what do you want out of me? So often we need these lessons as parents and grandparents because we'll begin to realign our kids. So at Christmas, we celebrate by telling our kids, look, Sandy was talking about this this morning. I said, there she goes getting on my sermon again. Hmm. But we always tell, don't ever tell our kids no. We know we want to have the best and the name brand clothes and the name brand shoes and the name brand this and that. And you know, that's the truth. We want to do better and good for our kids, right? But she said, you know, what happens the first time that you want that? And you got to tell them, and I'll say no to sex or drugs or alcohol. I told you yes to everything else, and I'll say no. But I know, just say yes to everything. It was yes. we got to come to the places where we begin to tell them first thing, kid, to seek the kingdom of God. We begin to ask our kids as you watch them up here on these front rows. 
And we begin to watch them. And I said, okay, now we've been teaching them and we've been asking, are we impacting them? And, and things are changing back there, by the way. There's more of them back there than there is out here. And you begin to think about what in the world is going on back there. And I said, I want to know. I invited them into the service. Is it a waste of my time? Is it a waste of your time? Or do we stay back here? I began to want to know. So a couple weeks ago, they set those same kids back there, and they set them inside the gymnasium, and they said, what do you like best about church? Oh, we love the coming to praise and worship. What's it mean to you? It means this to me. And we begin to listen to what they said, and I said, praise and glory to God. They're getting it. Amen? Amen. So we begin to think about the alignment piece and what we need to do. What we need to do is first seek the kingdom of God. For who? When you come in, kids, guess what? You see a couple of them come up here and, and, and debut today, didn't you? Yeah. But they want to praise God. They know what it's like to be in the trenches. They know what it's like to be hurt and to do without. They need to know, get your priorities straight. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Come on, you got this. Yeah, yeah they've seen the hurt. They've seen the brokenness. They've experienced it, haven't we? But it's time for us to say, not on my watch. Right. It's time for us to hope for more as we align our priorities. The second one, we need to begin to mend some relationships. As we seek first the kingdom of God, get priorities straight, mend relationships. So you know, I'm getting ready to announce it. It'll be in the next week's flyer. I'll be doing a teaching. You guys excited about this? Sound excited! Yeah. You better be a little more excited than that. And I will be in church on Wednesday. Don't lie in church. <laughs> Right. But I'm going to do a series on forgiveness on Wednesdays, and I'm going to teach on forgiveness. Let me tell you something. It's going to mess you up. Okay? Because you think, well, I've forgiven everybody. Wait till I unpack it. All right? Because the Spirit of God, presence, is going to tell you, man, you may never forgive that person that did you wrong or hurt you or betrayed you or dishonest. You just pushed it down. And the children keeps boiling up. And we got to make a decision now. Do we scrape it off? Do we get rid of it? Or do we push it down again? They wait for it to grow up and or go up again and again and we just keep pushing it down. But the second one is mended relationships. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 5 says, Hypocrite, let's get away started. Well, thank you, Lord. Listen, we are some hypocrites, amen. The world looks at us and calls us hypocrites, right? <coughs> Look, I'm just going to ask you this. Does your social media say you're a hypocrite? Huh? Does your boss say you're a hypocrite? Does your co-workers call you a hypocrite? Does your family call you a hypocrite? I can keep going, right? There's so many that can, and we might be offended by that, but see, if have been offended, how about we start paying attention to the tension? How about we go and say, you know what, man, there might be something there. Maybe that one out of 99 is all I need to hear today, but am I a hypocrite first? Remove the plank. Look at this. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll be see, able to see clearly to remove the specks from your brother's eye. Now, wow, what in the world is that saying, right? Now, this is pretty powerful, so you can look at the visual of it. This is the alignment of relationships is what it's talking about. You need to worry first about yourself. You are talking about people and their issues. You're worrying about their toothpick, and you've got a honking plank sticking out of your eye. You're worried about a toothpick that's in their eye, but you've got a telephone pole coming up out of here. Does this make any sense to us today? Now, how many of you have met that Christian? It's so easy to see what they need to do, what, what they need to do with their children. Uh, you get your children straight now, but your children don't even like to be around you. But you're going to tell everybody else about how to raise children. Uh, does this make any sense? Hey, you, you can see it is so clear to you, but don't you see the honky plank or telephone pole? In your own eye, yank the plank. Everybody say yank the plank. Yank the first, yank that plank from your own eyes, what it's saying. I'm telling you how to get in alignment for the blessings of God. God does not bless people who go around criticizing others as though they have no issues themselves. Wow. Deal with you first. Everybody say amen. Amen. And oh me. Oh me. Oh, because the truth is this when we're busy criticizing others, the problem is really not them. The problem is really us. And then the church, it's important. I take calls sometimes on my truck because I'm driving and I don't use it all, but I take them to their emergency and I begin there's people in my truck, it's family, and people will say, Oh my god, I didn't know they didn't want to do that. And I say, Oh my god, I forgot she was in here. Alright, but here's the truth of it. I love my church family. You love me. And we're all going through something. 
So we'll talk. You say, did you see sit outside the movement? Let's pray for them. Did you see what they did, what they acted, or what they said, or how they treated you? Yeah, it's all right. Let's pray for them. Because it just ain't your turn right now. This isn't my turn right now. But the truth is, we've got to reprioritize our relationships. We begin to understand, you know what? They might have a little speck in their eye. I'm kind of plank in line. I know the truth. God knows it bigger than me. Deal with you first. Deal with you first. Take authority and align the relationships. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, there remember that your brother has something against you. It says, get you sorry, but up to the altar and leave. No, it doesn't say that. I paraphrase and cut it out so it talks a little bit. It says, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. Leave your gift there. Go first. Everybody say first. first. It says first be reconciled. First make things right. First work on the relationship. First be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. But it's telling you there's a priority here. When we look back before that, Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. When we begin to think that there's something that's going on here, if I'm going to seek his righteousness, i got to do and act like God's telling me to the relationships I ought to be so faithful to. Can you say amen? amen? If you are in a position of unforgiveness, a position of bitterness maybe, or strife, and you're offended, it does you absolutely want to say here, no good to give an offering. That's hard to Better start off, you hypocrite. Get yourself in position. Don't let other people suck your joy out. Always, always do what's right. Because the devil can't do what's right. Because the devil is the devil of darkness. Go ahead and shine your light on them. First thing they want to do is accuse. That's okay. First, bring it. Leave it. Lay it away. Go and invest. It's on the altar. And my, my heart and my conscience is clear. And I don't care what they say or what they do. We need somebody to fix the relationships that we are in. We're in all kinds of relationships, and if you want the blessings of God this year, we must get in alignment. Be reconciled, it said. And if they don't want this, you've done your part, so don't worry about it. God can then bless your life and keep you in alignment. Uh, as we align our priorities, the third one, the authority of alignment. The authority of alignment. Look at this. Get your priorities straight. Mend those relationships. Do what you can do. It's not always going to be received. Who cares? You are getting you right with God. Amen? Amen. That's like when you forgive somebody. I'm going to teach on this. That ain't for them anyway. That's for you. Right. Amen? Yeah. And they don't care if they hurt you anyway. If they didn't they care, they wouldn't hurt you to start with. Right? Let it go. Forget about it. And let God have it. Authority of alignment. When we look at authority, authority of alignment in Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 29. It says, well, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first, here's that word, unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? Oh, man, some of you got some stuff that ain't left for a long time. You got some stuff. Let me, God, it says he's endued you with power from on high. You can't, he can't. Listen to this now. This has to do with the fact that the devil has stolen something personally from you. John 10, 10 says the enemy only comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Christ came so you could have a life and a life of abundance. What has the enemy stolen from you? He's stolen things like relationships, purity, money, health. He's stolen things from you, amen? You can no longer be passive and sit on the back row. Scripture says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence it says it takes it by force. That's the word of God. Sometimes we've got to stand up. He wants us to align with authority. And we've got to begin to speak to those things that are contrary to the Word of God. We've got to begin to speak to darkness with truth. And truth is life. And truth is light. We've got to begin to get in the Word of God so the Word of God gets into us. We take authority over the strong man. Satan has your stuff. He has it in a storage unit. And it's up to you if you want to keep paying the rent. But it's up to you if you want to leave it in the storage rent unit and pay rent. He's stolen, and he has stolen from us, and it says we'll never, ever get it back. Mm-hmm. And we say, well, that's okay. I'm glad somebody's paying the rent on it. It's not how it works. Satan has what your promises, your future, your blessings in a storage unit. You've been lack long enough. You've done without long enough. And it's time for us to get in the presence of God. Mm-hmm. But when you begin to look at what the Word says, we should begin to become excited people because of our promises of God. 
But the Bible says if you want your stuff back first, and everybody say first. It says, take authority and bind the strong man. Don't accept that it is going forever. Uh, if you lose your keys, you go find them. You lose your wallets, you go find them. And when I stood on this, this altar this past week, and I began to watch the spirit talk to talk those people came through, and I was praying for you to be blessed, and they prayed, I began to say, oh, I see you, you ugly demon spirit from hell coming against that family, and I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. And then I said, you stand up. Because when you come into the spirit tunnel, what's beginning to happen is the enemy's like a pig on your back. He jumps on, he gives you a rear naked choke, and he's trying to drag you and snuff you and wipe you out. But you have everything that it takes because God has called you to be an MMA fighter against the enemy to stand up and get him back and take back what the enemy is for. We have authority and authority of alignment. Uh, the devil has some stuff he's taken from you. Can't say amen. amen. Oh, he has. Don't accept that. It's going forever. Because it's not. It's not going forever. Oh, what's the devil want? Hmm. The devil wants you to whine and cry and gossip and skip church and not read the Bible and go ahead and suffer anyway. He wants to divide and conquer and wipe out and clean out. He wants to addict. He wants to stuff out. He wants to cheat you from the promises of God. That's what the enemy wants for you. He hates your guts. And he doesn't want you to make it. That's the enemy. That's the adversary. That's the elder above. That's Lutha, right? But that will want you to say, I've lost everything. I'll never get it back. But the Bible says that when the enemy comes against you, you are to bind that strong man up in the name of Jesus. I think today you're going to get something back. You're going to get your joy back. You're getting your dream back. You're getting your marriage back. You're getting your finances back. You're going to get your storage locker cleaned up. And you're coming back today. And now we're going to win. Yes, amen. We have the authority of alignment operating. We are not defeated people. We are not defeated. We have authority over demons, yeah. over the devils, and over the spirits of lack, the spirit of fear, the spirit of depression, the spirit of suicide, the spirit of discouragement, the spirit of failure, and the spirit of all the things that's contrary to the word of God. God is saying, bind those strong men up in the name of Jesus. I will restore to you the joy of your salvation, and the joy of your salvation when you got saved, even when you was high or drunk, or you was separated, or when you come to the loving knowledge in the togetherness that God is inside of me. He said, I'm about to restore you to the joy of your salvation. Yes, Lord. Let's go ahead and just take a praise break and then you say, God, I need my joy back. 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 God, I need my joy back. Yes, Lord. Now I'm taking it back. I'm taking it back. I'm taking it back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you shout, I'm taking it back. Then we said, oh, you think so? Huh? That's what we said from this pulpit. We're taking it back, devil. Yeah, we come and play church, but we want to be the church. We don't want to sing. We already said, man, you know what? Can you get up here and you get all messed up? And you begin to sing and you begin to praise God. And you do your five sit and sit your butt down. If God says to say 50, sing it. If he says change it, change it. If he says do it, do it. You know what? The presence of God is missing in the American church today. This is what this message is about. I'm taking it back. I'm taking it back. You taking it back? The praise and worship team, the leadership team in this church, we say, you know what? We're just going to go ahead and take it back, man. Yeah. We don't care what everybody else says. What they talk about us, it's okay. You're talking about us, you're giving everybody else a rest, but we're about to take some things back, amen? People begin to say, man, I know something's coming, man. God is up to something. It's like giving birth. Something's about to be birthed. Thank God you held on. It's going to get birth right here in this church. And when God begins to give birth to you, there's going to be a new spirit, amen? There's going to be a new fire. There's going to be a passion that can't be contained. It's going to be like fire in the bones, amen? 
you're going to come in and you're going to go out different every Sunday. And when they begin to see you, they're going to begin to shout hypocrite. And you're going to be, begin to shout anointed in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're going to be just coming and going and going and coming. No matter where you're at, they're beginning to look at you a little bit different. Think about that. So we've got to give our whole heart. Our whole heart. Our entire heart. Give your whole heart to what you're giving to God. Look at this, the, the fourth point. Give your whole heart. We've got to be all the way in. Everybody say amen. amen. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 39. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Oh, now here we go again, guys. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, with all the soul, and with all their mind. Here again we begin to see order. Heart, soul, mind. Get it in the heart, get it in your soul, and it comes through your mind and begins to go to other people. It begins to say, this is the first and greatest commandment. Oh, we can do this. Oh, first, I just got to fall in love with God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. These things will be added unto you. I got that. Oh, here's second. 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 You ready for it? Verse 39 the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Oh, no, I can't do that. Oh, I got number one, number two, forget it, amen. You said you seen my neighbor. Amen. Your neighbor's your mother-in-law. Yeah. I'm just kidding. It's my mother-in-law. Just kidding, mother-in-law. She listens to me. I'm only joking. I keep funny, all right? But, but the truth is, is, is uh, the neighbor is the person that you can't get along with. The, the neighbor is the person that rubs you wrong. The person that says you're a hypocrite. The one that says, oh, you don't know, you ain't got it. The one that just stand in your witness to say, I'm an atheist. Let me tell you, God made you in Jesus' image. He made you in his own image. And I'm telling you, God made no mistakes. Say what you want, but well, atheist means you just ain't saved yet. That's it. Amen. It said, what you want to say? It means you're stupid. Amen. Everybody say amen. I'm not telling you that come from first lady. Okay, so you begin to think about that. That's how we want to be listen. We got to stand up against the devil. That's a lie. You're made in the, every human being is made in the image of Jesus Christ and you make no mistakes. So when you get that naked that's rubbing you wrong, begin to love the dog out of them, amen? Hey, All right, I'll, I'll go ahead, man. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the alignment of your heart. This is the alignment of your heart. God wants to bless you in this new year, 2020. I want to open the windows of heaven, he says, and pour out on you a blessing that you cannot contain. Enough blessing that you will not have room enough to, to receive it. Does anybody need a blessing like that? Man, I've received it, amen. I've received it. I was a wretched, I was a broken, I was everything, with, but I was nothing without Christ. And when I got Christ, he realigned me, he aligned me, and he got me on the straight and narrow. He begins to do things that only he could. I am not that smart. I am not that, uh, listen, but I am that sensitive to the presence. Here's the first thing you have to do to get that little heart in alignment. Yeah. You like to preach on the heart is deceitful right. beyond cure who can understand it, but it also says it is the wellspring where life comes from. Yeah. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. This is the first and the greatest commandment with all your heart. Yeah. You see what you get excited about? And what you really get excited about, you know what it is? It's what you activate. You get excited about what you activate. What you get passionate about is what you activate. He says, I want your heart. And he's excited about it. And he wants your heart activated. I want you to this year give your heart to Christ. He said, I'm saved. That ain't enough. It's enough to get you into heaven. But he wants to use you now. And he needs that old heart of heart activated. He has the first commandment that he, that he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. We like all that, but we forget the part about love yourself, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. It says, love yourself as your neighbor. He says, I love you. He says, I love you. Don't listen to the voice of the enemy. It tells you to hate yourself, you're ugly, you're inferior, you're stupid. Think about this. A girl who's still part of our ministry after well over a decade, as I sat inside of a meal on Thanksgiving Day, at Main Lane Church of God. I walked up to this prostitute, crack addicted, hijacked, breached, broken, disgusted human being at herself. Everybody told her she's no good, you'll never amount to nothing, and you're worthless. 
But I told her something that day that changed her life for all eternity. I began to tell her, Jesus Christ loves you. Right. And her testimony today, she's come out of all that and she serves God. What she says today, that's the first time I ever thought really truly that a human being loved me is when you spoke that Jesus loves me. Amen. He loves you. No matter the hurt, the pain, or what you're going through today, if you've never felt the immense love of the Savior of the universe, let me tell you, God loves you. He doesn't hate you. He doesn't condemn you. He's not telling you you're ugly or inferior or that you're stupid. But you're everything in the precious joy in his eyes. The voices on the inside will tell you you can't do anything right. You're absolutely good for nothing. That is not in alignment with what the king has to say about you. That is not his voice that you're hearing it from. It is never the giants. Remember this message a couple weeks ago, right? The giants and the spies. It's never the giants that keep us out of the promised land. It's never the giants that will keep you out of your promised land. It was the ten spies that was on the inside. It was those ten that kept them from the victory. It was not the giants on the out, outside. The things that will stop you from your dream in your promised land. It, it will not be the giants as they are not authorized to stop you and to take away your call or to do whatever God's called you to do. It will always be the voices on the inside. The ten voices said we are not able. We cannot do it. We will never be able to overcome. But let you know that there was two that said we are able. Uh, ten said we can't do it. But the two said, well, you know, the ten was saying we're not good enough, we're not big enough, we're not strong enough, uh, they're too big, but the other said, we can't do it, beware of the voices on the inside, God said I want you to love yourself on the inside, and the two begin to say uh, I don't care what their account is I know that if God is before me I can have a Shadrach, Meshach and a Bendigo message shoved inside of me, and no matter what you do to me King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you can burn me up, you can slay me and kill me but I know if my God is before me, who in this world can be and he'll begin to say, hey, there must be something that like an image of Jesus Christ inside of you. I don't know how you overcame it again, but I know one thing. I surely see the presence of the living God. Give him a hand clap. Praise in the house today. You gotta get in alignment with the Lord, amen. Yeah. Number five. Thank you, Jesus, for the word. Seek inner purity. Seek inner pur purity. It says Matthew 23, 25, and 26. And we seek, seek this woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. There's that stinking word again. Hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. He was talking about a bunch of self-righteous Pharisees who wore white clothing and walked around and everybody knew how holy they really was. Oh, man. I want to preach this sometimes because today what's happened to me is I got saved and I begin to look at all these self-righteous, self-indulgent people who begin to call themselves Christ followers who was preaching from the pulpit who said that's not what the Word says. That is not truth. And you can add to it and take away from it. That's a lie right from the pit of hell. Whatever is the truth then today and forever will always be the truth. And the truth is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It is truth. Wow, think about it. Bunch of self-righteous self-centered Pharisees who want everybody to think it was holy. Jesus said, cleanse first that which is inside the cup. Cleanse first what's inside the cup. That is the alignment of your inner world. Listen, I'm going to talk about your inner world. You can't take the man out of the slum, but you've got to get the slum out of the man. Look, you can't, listen, you've got to get the slum out of man. You begin, if you have a problem with looking at something lustfully, you begin to say, it says in Job 31.1, I've made a covenant with my eyes, and I will not look lustfully at one woman. Woo, victory. And every time you start, you say, I have made a covenant with God's, uh, in God's word in my eyes, that I will not. And when you say, I will not, the devil has to flee. Temptation be ye gone in the name of Jesus. But you begin to change who you are. You begin to cleanse the cup inside. You begin to get the slum out of us. 
That alignment in your inner world is your purity, your thought life. They were so worried about looking the part on the outside, but on the inside, they were full of dead bones. Man, listen to me. And it's full of dead men's bones. The world feeds on what you are on the outside. And we've got to go to death and get our hair all pretty enough. How's she do? Amen. We go to get a look, get curtained up, and put our makeup on just right, and wear the best clothes, and we do everything on the outside, but on the inside. That's what God is looking for. God feeds on what you are on the inside. When's the last time that you went and got yourself curtained up on the inside? When's the last time you prayed and you fasted in the Word of God and you soaked in the Word of God in the testimony and you begin to praise and to pray to God? When's the last time that you dwelt in the presence of the living God? When was the last time you said, God? God, go ahead and lose me and mess me up and hijack me. Everything is falling apart. And my mom said, go to hell in the handbasket. But God, what I need out of you is I need the presence of the living God. I need you, God. Give me my hand for today. He's worthy. That's the one of your inner part. Listen, think about what we're talking about. Just don't skate past it. That is why Jesus stood at the door and he said, behold, I'm on the outside. And I'm not. And he's a perfect gentleman. You know that scripture, right? Yeah. He didn't stand and knock on the door and say, if you don't open the stinking door, I'm going to kick it open. I'm going to beat the snot out of you. He said, I stand at the door and I knock. He said, I died for you. I love you. Will you please just let me in the inside? He said, I know every mistake. I know your thoughts. I know everything before you ever thought. I know, but I'm enough. Oh, man. Think about what happened. I began to think about the game last night. You watched the game, and everybody else shut it off, right? It was 11 20, and everybody was just happy that New England lost, right? Yeah. But you begin to look. You begin to pay attention. You begin to see guys loving on each other, and crosses on their face. You begin to see the millions of dollars just left, the game really don't matter. You begin to see grown men get in a circle. You begin to see a whole hands and invoke the presence of God. They begin to love each other with passion. And they begin to pray for the presence. Yeah, you guys lost me. Maybe we won this time. Thank God we got our help. Thank God we have our God. Think about what was being displayed before us. Today we want to knock all the pros down, the college athletes and all the money. Yeah, but there's something wrong with it. But there's something in the middle of all that that's entertaining the presence of the living God. Is there something in the middle of our life entertaining the presence of a living God? Wow. I'm going to try to go on. And this is why Jesus stood at the door. He said, Behold, I'm at the outside and I knock. I want to come in and I want to sup with you, is what he said. You need to clean the cup on the inside. Some people always were only worry about what's on the outside or maybe what people think. But we need to worry about what's on the inside. We need to be clean in your purity, in your thought life. How about being clean in your attitude? How about being clean in your spirit? If you want to be in alignment of my blessings, he says, don't go around thinking your holiness is in your outside. Because you've got to get in on the inside. Then it will change things on the outside. He will do it. It's all about being clean on the inside. And he used the word, but first. But first. Put me first. Seek me first. Put me first. Then up the sixth one. Get in alignment with the body of Christ. John 20 and 19. I'm almost done. Get in alignment with the body of Christ. Jesus appears to his disciples here. Then the same day in the evening, being the first day of the week, then the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled. For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Get in alignment with the body of Christ on the first day of the week. You don't just come to church, hit, skip, and miss, but you get in alignment with the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the first day of the week, the Sabbath, Sunday. Make your priorities God's house this year. And watch the blessings find you when you're not even looking for them. Jacob said, I will call this place Bethel. And we know what Bethel means. He saw a vision of angels going up and down to heaven. He said, I found a gate of heaven, and I'm going to call this place Bethel, which means the house of God. 
There are things that God will do for you in church that he will not do for you by yourself. Yeah. Nothing can take the place of the alignment with the body of Christ. Which says one can put a thousand, listen to this, one can put a thousand, but here together, two, to put ten thousand to flight. Together is what it's about. See, the lie of the enemy is you're mad at each other. You might be mad at me, or you might be mad at Kim singing too long. Or you might be mad at each other, but together we can do some great things. Yeah. You hear me? You hear me, you hear me yeah. church? Yeah. Yeah. Look at someone next to you right now and say, I'm seven times stronger because I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> I'm going to give you one more chance now. Don't you miss it. Matthew, you tell him. I'm seven times stronger because I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> yeah. My prayer, my listen, my prayer, my praise, my faith are seven times stronger right now because we are assembled as a as a body of Christ. That's right. Wow. Listen, you're in the right place for a miracle today. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And the angels are here. But most of all, the presence of the living God is here. We're in alignment with the body of Christ. How you treat God's house is how God will treat your house. You will see direct blessings in alignment with how you align with the body of Christ. Make a commitment to the house of God this year. Align your priorities. The seventh and final point. Give God what's his. In Deuteronomy in chapter 20, uh, 26 verse 10. In Deuteronomy 26, 2, it says, Take some of the first fruits. Everybody say first. first. Take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. He said, You shall take the first fruits. That is in alignment with our money and the ability to produce money. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The tithe is the first. It is not the cost of admission to a gospel show. You don't come in here and pay to see how somebody sings or preaches or teaches. There's a connection point. The connection point is Malachi chapter 3 in verse number 10. This is the only place in God's word where it says, test me in this. Test me, it says. It says, the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. My question is this. For you, of those of us who bring the first fruit, we've all been challenged from this. We've all been challenged in, the, in our faith and we've grown, and we all grow at different levels. But have you not seen God pour out blessings on you that you can't contain by being faithful? Amen. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody clap in something? Amen. 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 Listen, in closing, I just want to share this. This message is really truly about this. I'm going to put this on the board for you. I, I hear the over, I want you to say this. I've heard this overarching message today. I hear it loud and clear. The age old Anakin, we would say. It's what's on the inside that counts. And it's absolutely true. You begin to think about all the seven points I shared with you. And if we begin to seek first the kingdom of God, first. If we begin to put God first. If we're in his word first. If we begin to do the first things first. God will do some brand new things. As you fast this week, begin to say, God, what do you want to do with me? How do you want me to give? What do you, how do you want me to teach? Or pray? Or serve? Or do? Or go? Begin to have God realign you and your priorities. Our Father is the creator of life, and he's given you a dream. Are you walking in the dream that God's given you? Our hope and our future, they're all his. They're all his. Think about this. They're all his, we know that. When we put him first and align our lives with his word, we have nothing to lose and absolutely everything to gain. If you want to be in the correct position to receive favor... And blessing from the Lord. You have to align your priorities with God's word. In closing as we stand. Praise and worship team. We'll come back up. <coughs> I told you. I, I, I want to. Just don't grieve.
free of the spirit right now. Just be patient just a second. I'm sorry I went over, but God wants to do something. There's some people in here today that need your car realigned. You need your life realigned. Keeping your spirit aligned makes life meaningful if our spirit's in line. Without it, nothing ever makes sense. But how about you? Are you spiritually aligned? Or do we need a little tweak and a little things put back where they go? This oil. Randy Green, come on up here. Fred, come on up here. Sandy, come on up here. Lisa. Big grab that oil. Big get that oil. Yeah, get that oil. You guys we have no chance. Steve, come on up there. As they're in a position right now of anointing their hands with what we call the presence of God. What's the presence? It's something that we're looking at that says that's symbolic of the presence of God. It's just a look. But I'm going to ask you next. And this is Mark, where's he at? Spread that across the front for me. Spread that across the front. Keeping your spirit aligned makes life meaningful. How about you? Are there some areas you need to reprioritize this morning? You know what it was like last week when we began to pray for the presence? We began to talk about what it is that God wants for each one of us. And before I came down here today, I wrote this at the top of my message. And I had Miss Lisa read it for you. Presence equals passion. If you're not passionate about the presence of God, that's not ignite me, God. God, I used to be on fire. God, I used to have it going on. God, I know I need something brand new from you, and I don't even know what it is. As we begin to sing and praise, listen, these are elders of the church. They love you. They care about you. They pray for you daily. That's some of our responsibilities as leading a church. But some of you are going to want to be aligned to that. Today, there's going to be places in between there where you can just come and pray. There's going to be chairs that you can kneel and pray. But if you want the anointing, that oil laid upon you for the presence of God, I'm going to ask you to start coming to them. Don't go away on Come on. Somebody's like, I need that right now. I'm on my next breath. It's all right. Come on. And I hope there's just so many that we can't stand it. As they keep coming, as they keep walking up here, keep our spirits. Let's get it in line. Let's make our lives in alignment. There's some things that's got to be reprioritized. Maybe a spiritual alignment is what you need. Maybe you need to say, you know what, man, I've been treading on the edges of it my whole life. I've got to get myself all the way in. It doesn't matter what my kids or my family or anybody thinks. They're going to anoint you right now and say, God, let the presence of God flow. It's not about being perfect. It's not about following a set of rules. It's about changing from the inside out. It's about seeing him open the windows of heaven pouring out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to contain it. It's really truly about the presence of the living God. But if you're passionate about his presence, he will change everything. Some of you that stand in line, just go ahead and get behind the next person and begin to pray for them. They're getting ready to start singing. There's incredible warriors who's at this altar right now so going to stand up and pray with you too. But as we begin to touch and anoint amongst us, what we're saying is, God, we require your presence. We can't do nothing without you, but we can accomplish everything with you. But today we're going to use the Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 experience, and we're going to say we're going to go ahead and seek ye first the kingdom of God. And whatever God wants for me in my life, I don't got to have it figured out. I don't got to know it all. I got to simply ask God to come in and reprioritize who I am this year.